Okay, colleagues, uh, good evening. Good evening, colleagues. Uh, are you good able? evening, sir. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Okay. okay. Good, good evening, evening, sir. Uh -huh. Perfect, 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 perfect. How's been perfect. your week? How's been your week? Busy. I can imagine. I can imagine. Okay, so okay, so with, yeah, this is uh, four minutes uh, past uh, seven o'clock, the time that we scheduled uh, the talk. I believe a lot of um, our colleagues have joined today, and like last time, I'm recording this lecture so for the benefit of those that uh, may not be present, and for those that may want to. Um, um, replay the lecture. Um, I'd like to get some feedback. How did you listen to the previous lecture? How was your experience? Were you able to play it? Or do you have any? Yes, please. Is there anybody willing to give me some feedback on the previous talk? So we never so received, we never received it. it. Oh, I think uh, ClassRip has uh, some explaining to do. ClassRip, are you with us? Are you here? Yes, I actually Is the ClassRip not here? Oh, that's strange. Oh, there's only 10, 10 people. Anyways, so I did send the video to the class rep, um, the recording of um, the last talk, just like I am going to send this video, a recording of this talk. Um, that is my style. Um, so please do give me feedback uh, when you get a chance to see the old video and the current video. I need to get feedback if the voice projection is clear, explanations are clear, and if it is useful to you, if I should continue recording or if I should not. Anyways, without wasting a lot of time, so today we are talking about cells, tissues, and membranes. And um, of course, I need no introduction. I didn't introduce myself in the last lecture. These are the objectives um, for today's lecture. We basically expect that at the end of this talk, somebody should be able to define what a cell is. Somebody should um, basically have a, a general concept, the basic structure of the human cell. Somebody should explain the structural and characteristics of, of the human cell. And um, somebody should be able to discuss the organelles of the human cell and some of their functions. As we discussed last time, and as you may know already, the cell um, is the, the basic living structure and functional unit of the body. And the study of cells is basically referred to as pathology. As you may know already, an image that you've been seeing uh, your whole life, I'd like to think, is that of a human cell, it's the basic structure of a human cell. And you can see that on the outside um, here, we've got the plasma membrane. It is the plasma membrane that basically um, um, uh, separates the um, intracellular space and the extracellular space of this cell. And you can see that inside the cell, there's a liquid part and the, there's a solid or rather solid inclusions in this um, a liquid part of the cell. So the liquid part of the cell is basically referred to as the cytoplasm. And you can see that these solid components in the cytoplasm are basically referred to as organelles. And amongst examples of the organelles, like we mentioned before, we've got the nucleus, we've got the endoplasmic reticulum, we've got the ribosomes, we've got the mitochondria, we've got the Golgi uh, apparatus, etc etc 
and we are going to discuss details um, um, as we go in the lecture. So as we have already discussed, the main components of the cell basically include the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, the cytoplasm, the organelles, and other inclusions. So to give a little bit more detail um, about um, the plasma membrane that we've already mentioned, it's basically a thin outer membrane which maintains the integrity of the cell. It is important uh, in that it keeps uh, the cell and its contents basically separate from the surrounding or the extracellular fluid, if you like, or extracellular environment, if you like. The interesting thing about this uh, plasma membrane, as you may know already, is that um, even though um, it is one membrane, but it is made up of two layers. And these layers is basically made up of phospholipids, cholesterol, glycolipids, and carbohydrates, as I am going to show you. In this picture, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that I'm showing you a, a drawing, basically, of what should be a cell membrane. And the cell membrane is basically these little balloon-like structures that you can see. And you can see that there are two layers of these balloon-like structures. So these red balloon-like structures over here. I hope you can see my arrow. And you can see um, other balloon-like structures or millet. If you are a farmer, a wannabe farmer like such as myself, you may see millet seed or even soybean seed um, um, uh, looking red. But interestingly, you see that to each of these um, um, little round structures are sort of tails attached to them, and each of them has two tails. So what basically makes up what these round structures um, of this cell membrane, this is referred to as the heads of the cell membranes. And these little tail-like looking structures are also what is referred to as the tails um, 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 of, the, um, um, of the cell membrane. So you can see, so we've got an, um, an outer layer and an inner layer. Because it's made up of two layers, that is why it is referred to as a lipid by by layer basically so the interesting thing also is that you see the heads are referred to as hydrophilic so hydrophilic meaning that they are water loving um, the tails are basically referred to as hydrophobic now this plasma membrane as you are going to see is designed in in, in, in such a way that um, lipid substances will have no problems, um, you know, moving from the outside of the cell, crossing inside into the cell and the other way around. However, charged molecules, um, you know, would have a hard time to go through, or even water itself would have a hard time going through the plasma membrane to enter into the cell. For that to happen, it needs to be assisted, you know, uh, by traversing through special gates. And these special gates are basically made up of these bluish looking structures that you can see here. So these are basically referred to as the integral proteins. So these integral proteins um, um, act in such a way that it allows certain substances that would not ordinarily close this plasma membrane have access or being uh, be able to move from outside the cell into the cell. So an example I gave you is that of water. Another good example would be that of glucose. You would also notice that um, in this plasma membrane, we have um, um, uh, these yellowish um, looking structures that is seemingly attached to the um, lipid bilayer that you are um, trying to describe here. And these yellowish looking structures are basically made up of um, cholesterol. It is important um, in maintaining um, the structural um, integrity of the cell membrane. 
in addition to that, you you see that you've got what is referred to as um, glycolipids or glycocalyx, uh, these molecules that are basically on the surface of this um, 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 uh, 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 cell membrane. So these are important in that they can help the cell to communicate to other cells. For instance, the configuration of these molecules um, uh, on the surface of the cell would take a special format to alert other cells, such as the cells of the immune system, to know that, uh, okay, um, this particular cell uh, belongs to the body because um, so that it should not be attacked. Um, on the other hand, a cell that is maybe from a pathogen or a microbe will not have these characteristics on its surface. And so the immune system will recognize this um, uh, glycocalyx of the microbe as foreign and will attack um, 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 uh, uh, this particular cell that is foreign. And thus, you know, preventing pro proliferation um, of cells of foreign origin or that from microbes, which could potentially cause disease, which could potentially cause illness, and which could potentially cause the demise um, of the uh, organism. Okay, that's brief in part uh, of the structure of the uh, uh, cell membrane. Uh, are we clear up to this uh, stage or we have questions? It's clear for me, sir. It's stuff you know already, isn't it? It must be boring. Don't you think? <laughs> no learning is taking place, Doc. Okay, moving on. So, what are the functions um, of this uh, plasma membrane that we are talking about? Oh, for your information, um, there was a question um, in the previous, uh, in some of these exams, um, where um, I think uh, um, a candidate were asked to write short notes on the plasma membrane. So this is not for nothing. So you can see there's quite a lot. I mean, you can just on the structural composition of the plasma membrane, there's quite a lot. You can talk about the, you know, the, you know, these heads and tails, the hydro, hydrophilic heads, hydrophobic tails. You can talk about the integral proteins. You can talk about the cholesterol. You can talk about the glycoproteins and the role they play. Oh, by the way, um, um, please do take time to read. Sometimes I put additional information in the notes of the slides. So as you can see here, I've over-summarized it, but it is important. For instance, apart from just uh, uh, being important um, in helping, um, uh, you know, cells of the body be identified as belonging to the body, um, these glyco uh, 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 proteins on the surface of the plasma membrane are also useful in cell adhesions and could be useful in maintaining uh, integrity. Um, yeah, and also um, could be also useful um, in signaling um, uh, or communication, if you like, between cell to cell. Anyway, so. What are some of the functions of this plasma membrane? So, as we said already, and it's no brainer, that the plasma membrane separates the cytoplasm, that is the inside of the cell, from the extracellular uh, fluid. It also separates um, um, one cell from another cell. It also uh, uh, provides an abundant surface on which chemical reactions may happen. It's also important in that it regulates the passage of materials in and out of the cell. It's also important in that it lets some, um, uh, some of the materials in and some of the materials out. Um, we did mention already that the plasma membrane contains uh, what are known as plasma proteins. 
the ones that we refer to as integral proteins on the drawing they are, they appear bluish bluish like or light sky blue if you like and these um, are known to traverse the length of the cell membrane and these are important in that they act as channels for electrolytes and land lipid uh, substances so what do i mean by this so um, we did say that lipids really have no trouble um, uh, traversing the, the plasma membrane. However, um, polar substances, you know, if you're talking about, for instance, sodium or you're talking about your potassium, it can't just easily move from the extracellular space, you know, to the intracellular space. There must be a special channel that is going to allow it to move from the extracellular space or the intracellular space, or vice versa. And these special channels will come in the form of these um, integral proteins or plasma proteins that traverse the length um, uh, of the plasma uh, membrane. OK. So we can talk um, uh, in brief about the functions um, um, of the plasma proteins. We did say already that the plasma proteins are important um, um, in giving um, um, a particular cell its immunological identity. That is to say, these proteins are important um, in basically, like we've already said, um, uh, to differentiate um, uh, cells that belong to the body and cells that are foreign. They may also act as sites where special um, uh, hormones um, uh, may bind and other, you know, chemical messengers. Um, in certain cases, they may act as um, uh, enzymes for uh, particular reactions. I already gave you an example where the um, uh, this uh, uh, plasma proteins are useful in transporting uh, uh, certain substances such as water or glucose which otherwise would have a hard time, you know, uh, uh, crossing between the extracellular and the intracellular uh, 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 spaces. An example um, 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 of the process where these, um, um, these proteins would help, um, um, you know, water or glucose move between the intracellular uh, or the extracellular space would be that of um, facilitated diffusion and we shall talk about this in detail in our next talk. So these plasma proteins are also involved, um, um, uh, act, um, would act as a pump and may help to uh, transport, um, um, you know, substances even um, against gradient. So in that case, that would be active transport. And we shall um, uh, give details about this in our next talk. In this picture, ladies and gentlemen, you can figure that we are looking at the uh, plasma membrane. As you can see, it's a it's a, a, a lipid bilayer. You can see, you can make out these greenish heads, and you can make out their tails. You can make out these yellowish um, molecules, which we said are cholesterol. This pinkish. Now I'm a man, so I'm terrible with colors. So I'd like to think that this looks pink. I am not sure, but I think it's pink. You can see that this particular molecule is traversing the whole length um, um, of this uh, plasma membrane. And this is what we are referring to as the plasma protein. So you can imagine um, a polar molecule such as water or glucose, if it comes um, and it wants to enter the cell, it won't easily go in. However, um, you will have specialized um, uh, plasma proteins that will be able to allow um, either glucose or water to move from the extracellular space into the intracellular space, depending um, on the requirement um, of that particular cell. You can also see that sometimes we've got um, um, uh, carbohydrate inclusions um, um, on these proteins, and hence called glyco proteins and you can see that it is these molecules that will give um, a cell its particular identity 
in terms of um, uh, being recognized by the immune system as self or foreign that we've been trying to uh, speak about. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have uh, the cytoplasm. Um, the cytoplasm basically is um, what makes up the inside of the cell. Um, and it's made up of various components. Um, it is mostly made up of water to the tune of 75 to 90%. You can look at it as a semi, um, thick semi, uh, a transparent elastic fluid, which contains, contains suspended particles. Um, apart from these particles, which are referred to as organelles, it also contains proteins carbohydrates, lipids, and other inorganic compounds. So the particles or the particulate matter in this cytoplasm is referred to as organelles. And these organelles are basically specialized portions of the cell, which may have a characteristic shape. And each of these play a specific role. It could either be in growth, it either be in maintenance of the cell, it could be repair, or it could be in the control of replication. I will now give you some of the examples of these organelles, which I'm pretty sure you know already. S sorry, Doc. There are colleagues uh, who are requesting to be allowed into the presentation. I don't know. Okay, one moment. Okay, sorry about that. Let's see if we can add these our friends. Okay, I believe everybody has joined. So we're basically um, looking at some of the examples um, of uh, the organelles. So one of the largest organelles, as you may know already, is the nucleus. So you know that basically all the cells of the body contain a nucleus except for the red blood cells. Interestingly, um, some cells of the body may have more than one nucleus. Among those include, um, uh, uh, you know, um, skeletal muscle cells. Um, so it's usually um, um, uh, oval in shape. And um, it's usually the, the largest um, uh, organelle in a cell. Um, it is said to contain um, genetic material in form of DNA or RNA. Um, RNA is basically, you know, um, what stores the information about an, an organism. So in terms of, you know, I mean, what determines my height is because of information that I've gotten from my father and his father and his father before him. And the RNA is basically the molecule that basically picks that information and transfers that information to the site of production of molecules. And I'm going to give details uh, a little bit. So apart from the what we have said, the nucleus is also important in the control of cell activity and structure. Um, and it is separated from the rest of the cell by a double membrane, which is called nuclear membrane. The nuclear membrane also contains what is known as the nucleolus. The nucleolus uh, helps in the synthesis um, of ribosomes. So nu the nucleolus is, is an area, defined as an area, which is made up of RNA uh, and proteins um, 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 where ribosomes are basically made. 
talking about ribosomes. So ribosomes are basically tiny granules that are composed of ribosomal RNA. The ribosomes are basically um, the organelles that are responsible for producing um, amino acids using the RNA as a template. So you could say it's more like I don't know if you guys are old. Yeah, I mean you're probably my age, mates. So you may know that um, it's like um, so you have this um, in the olden days. I think you remember we used to use uh, if somebody I think wants to print a newspaper. So I think they would have um, a stencil, something like that. So you the stencil is something permanent. But I think using a stencil, you can make something temporal, and that temporal thing then can be used to print multiple papers. So, you know, RNA and DNA is like that. So, you'll have the RNA molecule coming to copy the information on the DNA. Then the RNA molecule will take this information that it has copied from the DNA, and when it goes to the ribosomes, it's going to use the information from the DNA that it has copied to produce particular amino acids based on the information that it got um, from the DNA. So examples um, um, of uh, this particular um, uh, amino acids that will be produced are in the ribosomes based uh, uh, on the information copied from the DNA that will be in the RNA includes, um, you know, enzymes, um, uh, hormones, you know, antibodies, structural proteins, etc., etc. So this is to say, the kind of enzymes an individual is going to produce is basically will be based, you know, um, uh, on the information that an individual has inherited, you know, along, um, uh, you know, the genetic line or basically from his forefathers. The kind of hormones and the kind of antibodies um, will also the thing take the same path as that um, of the enzymes. Okay, so these um, ribosomes may be found as free units um, 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 or may be uh, attached on the nuclear surface or may be found on the surface of the endoplasmic um, reticulum. In this image, ladies and gentlemen, this groundnut looking structure that you see here is basically an important um, um, uh, organelle which is referred to as a mitochondria, but that is not um, uh, the subject of discussion. What we are looking at are these tubular structures that you can see on the side, um, and you can, uh, this is referred to as the endoplasmic reticulum. But you can see that this endoplasmic reticulum seems to have small, small little things that are on its surface. It is these small, small things on its surface that are referred to as ribosomes. And when the endoplasmic reticulum has these small, small little things on its surface, this endoplasmic reticulum will be referred to as rough endoplasmic reticulum. We're talking about ribosomes. And I just took time to explain what is happening in the picture and to show you that this endoplasmic reticulum has got ribosomes attached to it. And when that happens, this endoplasmic reticulum will be referred to as a rough endoplasmic reticulum. Speaking of en the endoplasmic reticulum, it's basically an extensive series of interconnecting interconnecting membranous canal that you're going to find in the cytoplasm. It is divided into two types. You, you already know about the rough endoplasmic reticulum that we are from describing now. So if there's a rough endoplasmic reticulum, also known as granular, or aka granular endoplasmic reticulum because of the presence of the ribosomes, there's also what is known as smooth, AKA, or also known as a granular endoplasmic reticulum. The difference between these two fundamentally is that one 
obviously has ribosomes, which is the rough one. And the other does not have ribosomes on its surface, which is the smooth one. But in addition, um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is primarily responsible um, for production um, of amino acids which in the ribosomes, which then uh, will make uh, proteins. The smooth and plasmic reticulum is primarily responsible for synthesis of lipid and steroid hormones and also takes um, an important role, takes uh, an important role in the detoxification um, um, uh, of the body. So the endoplasmic reticulum is also um, involved um, in the um, exchange uh, of materials uh, between the um, intracellular. Uh, well, I think I need to edit this point. I think we can ignore this one. So anyway, so when this um, endoplasmic reticulum uh, synthesizes either proteins or um, these uh, lipid or steroid hormones that we talked about, it's not only responsible for production, but is also um, responsible uh, for storage of some of these um, molecules. So ladies and gentlemen, um, in this diagram, what we are basically looking at, um, this is the nuclear envelope or the membrane that basically surrounds um, the nucleus, which we said is the largest organelle that you're going to find in the cell. And you can see that um, this, uh, um, um, just next to it, you're going to find this um, network of interconnected tubules, which is basically the endoplasmic reticulum that we are talking about. And you can see that this network is studied with this reddish looking substances on it, which is basically referred to as ribosomes. And we did say that if you find ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum, it's going to be referred to as rough endoplasmic reticulum. And we said that this is primarily um, um, uh, dedicated to the production of amino acids, which we eventually will make proteins. You can see that on this other side, we do have this network um, um, of tubules, uh, which is also attached to the nuclear envelope. But you can see that on this side, these um, reddish looking uh, substances that we see on the rough endoplasmic reticulum are not present on the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And it is called smooth because it doesn't have these reddish looking things, which we call ribosomes. And we said that this is uh, primarily responsible for production of steroids and lipid substances. What you are looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, is basically um, an image taken with an electron microscope. Pretty sure you know the difference between a light microscope and an electron microscope. Um, if there's any of us that does not know an electron microscope, well, a light microscope is basically what you're going to find in your laboratories. If you do an MCS or an MPS and you want to see the malaria parasite, you can see it, you know, with your light microscope and you can see cells with your light microscope. However, if you want to look at a high power magnification, so you now want to actually see, you know, what is contained, um, um, uh, you know, let's say you wanted to look at these organelles that we are looking at. You need to um, use um, an electron microscope, and you can see that in this image with an electron microscope, we're able to see this network of the endoplasmic reticulum, which is studded um, um, uh, with these ribosomes, and which makes it rough. And you can see on the other end, it is a network of uh, tubules, which is the endoplasmic reticulum, but does not have you know, this studying of the ribosomes on the other side. It therefore then makes it small endoplasmic reticulum. 
Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, we also have what is known as the Goji complex or the Goji apparatus. So the Goji apparatus basically consists of uh, stacks of loosely folded, um, a flattened membrane sacs. Um, um, so basically what happens here, the Goji apparatus is like a packaging warehouse of the cell. So what's going to happen basically is that you're going to have the um, um, amino acids and uh, proteins that are going to be manufactured, you know, um, in the um, Goji, or rather the endoplasmic reticulum, specifically the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They are then going to be sent to the Goji apparatus. The Goji apparatus is going to produce um, um, a membrane a membrane around the substances. And this membrane around the substances is important because it's going to make it easy for storage um, of the molecules that have been synthesized. In this case, we're talking about particular proteins. So a protein that is manufactured in the endoplasmic um, uh, uh, reticulum could be enzymes or could be antibiotics, like we already said or it could be a structural protein, or it could be a hormone. So you understand. So it may be stored in the cytoplasm, the cytoplasm of a cell, and it will be covered by a membrane that will be produced in the Golgi apparatus. At the right time, when this hormone or enzyme is required to be secreted in a certain part of the body, this membrane that has been formed around this particular protein is going to fuse with that um, of the plasma membrane, which is the main membrane of the cell. Now you can imagine when this uh, membrane of the protein fuses with the plasma membrane of the cell, the contents um, 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 of this smaller membrane inside the cytoplasm is going to be excreted outside the cell. And that process is referred to as exocytosis, as I am going to show you now. So you can see from here, do we have any questions? Looks like I'm doing a lot of preaching here. Are we together? Yeah, yeah, well, that's the trouble with online classes. You're not sure if people are listening or not. Anyways, I take it that we're. To... Anyways, I take it that we're. To... Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Absolutely, absolutely. So anyway, guys, absolutely, um, absolutely. I'm basically uh, talking about these. Um, so imagine, in this diagram, what I'm basically showing. So this would be the cell membrane. So this is the plasma membrane that we spoke about when we began the talk. So what we are saying is that these bluish looking structures would be a protein that has been manufactured by the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And we said that this will then, you know, be taken to the Goji apparatus or the Goji complex, which is then going to form this whitish membrane around it. I mean, you can imagine if a particular hormone enzyme is produced in the rough endoplasmic Reticulum, and let us say that it's not joined together. I mean, if you don't form a membrane around it, it's just going to be diluted in the cytoplasm. And if, re as and when it is required to be released at a certain time, you know, you won't have it because, I mean, how do you mobilize? It will be difficult. But if you form a little membrane around it, if you require it to be secreted, you basically are going to obviously institute certain a cascade of reactions that are going to cause, as you can see, what is happening here in one. 
is basically inside the cytoplasm. It starts to move towards the main plasma membrane. And when it reaches the main plasma membrane, it fuses. And when it fuses, you can see it opens up and you can see that this particular protein um, is released um, um, in the um, extracellular space. It could be in the blood or it could be, let us say, um, yeah, I mean, let us, if we say that maybe uh, this particular protein uh, is a homo, you could figure it could be something like maybe um, the thyroid gland that has produced thyroid hormone that is now releasing the thyroid hormone into circulation from its cytoplasm by the process of exocytosis. What you're looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, is basically um, a colored image, these greenish looking structures of membrana stacks is basically uh, what was seen on, on, on an electron microscope as the Golgi apparatus. Seeing that you are getting bored, I am almost done. This is uh, we're close to the end. We also have um, what is known as the mitochondria. Most of, most of you know the mitochondria as the powerhouse um, of the cell. It's basically a small spherical road, um, a, a shaped organelle, um, sometimes maybe filamentous in structure or maybe sources shaped if you like. This particular organelle is special in that this is where the process of glycolysis and the Krebs cycle take place. Um, 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 and these will result, these two processes will result in uh, production of ATP. And ATP, you know, for lack of a better term, is the energy currency of the body. By that I mean, if you are going to do any process that requires energy, you will most likely require the use of ATP. And this ATP is going to be produced with the help or the reaction between glucose and oxygen. The mitochondria is also special in that it's, also, uh, uh, it's made up of two membranes. So you've got an outer or upper membrane and you've got an inner membrane. So the inner membrane is smooth without foldings, or rather the outer membrane is smooth without foldings, but rather the inner one is folded, and the foldings in the inner membrane of the mitochondria are referred to as cristae. It is on the surface um, um, of um, uh, this cristae, that's where you are going to find a lot of these um, respiratory enzymes, that will be responsible for the production of this ATP, which we refer to as the energy currency of the body. Interestingly, so um, uh, basically tissues that are known to require a lot of this ATP, we generally have a lot of mitochondria in this, their cytoplasm. So examples of these include the liver, skeletal muscles, um, the cardiac muscle, spermatozoa, and interestingly, even some cancers. As you know, cancer cells um, basically require a lot of energy, and you know that they will eat and they will not stop eating. In addition to eating, they'll be replicating and replicating like that. So some cancers do, if not most, as a matter of fact, will have a lot of the uh, mitochondria in their cells in order to produce the energy required um, to support, you know, um, um, uh, the behavior of these uh, cancer cells. What you're looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, is basically a cross section through a, a drawing of the mitochondria. And you can see here that we basically do have an outer membrane which is smooth. And you can see that on the inside, we have a folded membrane uh, with the foldings that we are referring to as cristae. And if you magnify this, you're going to see that 
this uh, crystal is basically started with a, a lot of enzymes uh, that will um, help this mitochondria in uh, uh, um, aiding the reaction between oxygen and glucose and helping the body to produce the much needed uh, ATP for the several um, body processes uh, that take place. Guys, we also have what are known as ly lysosomes. Um, lysosomes are basically, um, so you know, they, these are membrane structures that are, are produced from the Golgi complex. But inside these membrane structures, um, you will have um, um, proteins that are um, enzymes. And these enzymes are referred to as lysosomal enzymes. These um, um, uh, 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 lysosomal enzymes, or this kind of organelle, the lysosomes basically, are quite common in um, white blood cells, um, in particular the phagocytes. So you can imagine a phagocyte engulfs a microbe or engulfs a virus uh, inside its cytoplasm, and when that happens, it's going to then release these lysosomal enzymes um, on the foreign uh, object so that these, lysos these lysosomal enzymes would digest um, those uh, 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 foreign substances or pathogens. So either microbes or viruses, you know, that kind of thing. Guys, inside the cytoplasm, you also have um, what is known as cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is basically a network um, of three types of tiny strands of protein. Namely, you've got the microfilaments, which are the smallest uh, fibers that provide support and help maintain the char characteristic shape of a cell and help to permit contraction of a cell. Uh, an example is that of actin, and you're going to find actin in a muscle cell, um, be it smooth, cardiac, or skeletal. We are going to talk about this in one of the topics. So you also have uh, intermediate microtubules. Um, these are found in cells that are basically subject to a lot of mechanical stress, and they are useful um, in stabilizing organelles, uh, such as the nucleus. You also have microtubules. Um, these are large contractor of proteins, and they're in involved in the movement of organelles uh, within the cell. An example of these microtubules um, you see them when you talk about um, 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 the cell division, and we shall refer to this, I think, in our next topic. So a practical example of um, these uh, structural proteins that you may find in the cytoplasm and will help to give, um, um, you know, a particular um, structure uh, to a cell is that of an intestinal cell, as you can see in the diagram. So this is basically a columnar cell that is taken from the small intestines. You do know that from the small intestines is uh, important um, in um, allowing for digestion, but also uh, for absorption of uh, essential nutrients. And you also know that these particular Cells which are typically columnar have what is known as microvilli. The microvilli does not just become. If you look on the surface, you would think that, ah, oh, the cells just merely have extensions. It just doesn't happen by accident. It happens because you've got these, you can see these strands of microfilaments that are basically pushing on the plasma membrane. So, you, so this is where the cell should end. But you can see these finger-like protrusions from the surface of this cell that make up the microvilli. And obviously, the point for the microvilli is to increase the surface area, first of all, for the digestion to take place, but also to, 
increase the surface area for the absorption of the several essential um, uh, nutrients um, um, that the body needs from the chia. Um, apart from um, cell extensions that we talked about, sometimes you have cell extensions that may even aid um, in the movement um, of a particular cell or movement of substances. And examples of this would be cilia or flagella. So you do know that, um, you know, I mean, when you have an irritation or a respiratory infection, you'll find yourself coughing out sputum. Basically, you know, these are mucus secretions along your airway and how are they finding yourself at the back of your throat? Well, it's because the cells of your respiratory system have hair-like protrusions. And they're designed in such a way that they'll be beating in unison, as if they're an, an army, you know, and being commanded by some commander. And as they beat in unison, they'll be moving these secretions, you know, these mucus secretions, you know, from deep down, your respiratory um, system all the way up, you know, to the back of your throat. This is important because it would help to clear any foreign substances to remove them, obviously, or prevent them, you know, from entering your lungs where they could possibly cause an irritation or an infection. And it's one of the ways, you know, the respiratory system will protect it, protect itself, um, you know, uh, basically from um, foreign substances. This kind of uh, beating is not peculiar to the, the respiratory system. You're also uh, going to find it in the reproductive system, in particular in the fallopian tubes, as an egg, you know, will move from the ovary and it makes its path um, towards the um, uterus. So there's cilia beating involved there as well. Um, an interesting modification of a cell extension that may cause movement um, in a cell would be uh, the flagella. And the flagella is quite prominent in cells such as spermatozoa. It is this flagella, the cell extension in the spermatozoa, which allow it to move. I mean, we are all familiar with how um, spermatozoa um, will move, basically. Is there any questions up to this point? We're almost done. Are we together? Ladies and gentlemen, I've bored you this time around. My apologies. Anyway, in conclusion, we can talk about cell inclusions, and these are large and diverse group of chemicals, and they're mainly organic. And some examples um, of these cell inclusions may be things like melanin, it could be glycogen, or it could be lipids, that sort of thing. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, ends our discussion today. You're welcome to ask questions. Oh, is there a hand? Yes, uh, Madam Kapembwa. Uh, uh, not quite on the, the last slide, the previous slide. Okay. I'm not clear on the previous slide. Okay. So, so Madam Kapemba, I was just saying that with all, so basically what we have done in this talk is that we have talked about the architecture of a basic human cell. So we've talked about, you know, um, basically, you know, the, the envelope, which is the plasma membrane. We've talked about organelles. 
We've gone in detail to describe some of the prominent organelles, but we've also said, look, in this plasma, or rather in this cytoplasm, apart from the organelles um, that we have described, you may also have other inclusions in the cytoplasm. And this could be, for instance, we do know that um, in the liver, um, as a form of storage of carbohydrates, we may have um, glycogen, which is basically carbohydrate stored in that form. From glucose, it enters um, the liver cells and will be stored as glycogen, you understand? Or it could be, what did we say here? Or it could be other lipids, basically. So you understand what I mean? So I'm basically saying that apart from the organelles, you can have other molecules that you may find in the cytoplasm, which could be in any form, really. And I gave those examples. Is that fine? Yes, it's clear now. Okay. Do we have any questions? Hello, are we together? Are we together? Sorry, I, I, I can't see the screen, but if you've raised your hand, please do ask the question. Uh, it's not actually a question. Uh, earlier I had issues with the network, so I couldn't respond. Uh, in regard with the issue of uh, the previous video. Oh, is that the question? So for those who, uh, obviously, yes. Yes, you can go ahead. So obviously for, yes, for those who didn't manage to come across, I, I had sent a message, I had sent a message in the group saying um, and I was unable to share the video using WhatsApp. So I texted to say people should at least text me using Telegram and I sent to quite a number of uh, people. So for those who didn't manage, they can still send me a message via Telegram so that I forward to them the video since I'm unable to send via WhatsApp. Okay. Thank you very much, Classroom. That's it. Okay, if there are no other concerns, that's it for today. We can meet next week. Are you comfortable writing a test now? Are we comfortable writing the test, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. I guess that subject can be discussed with class rep. We shall arrange a day when we can just do a small assessment.